Hi, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the program today. I'm Philip Brookman. I'm a curator uh, here in the Department of Photographs at the National Gallery and uh, curator of the exhibition Dorothea Lang Seeing People. And it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Wendy McNaughton on Dorothea Lang. And so uh, I want to first thank you for joining us on a, a beautiful day uh, for a talk with uh, San Francisco-based artist Wendy McNaughton about her art and her appreciation uh, for the work of the great American photographer Dorothea Ling. And before we begin, I'm just going to introduce her briefly. Uh, Wendy's work is based uh, in the practices of drawing, social work, and storytelling. And I think storytelling is a key word here, uh, which connects what she does very closely to uh, Dorothy Lang's photographs, which also incorporate a kind of incredible ability to tell stories about people. Uh, Wendy is an illustrator, graphic artist, uh, and author of many books as a visual columnist for the New York Times and California Sunday Magazine. She drew stories everywhere, from high school cafeterias to Guantanamo Bay. She's authored and drawn two books, How to Say Goodbye and Meanwhile in San Francisco, and illustrated many others, including the number one New York Times bestseller, uh, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, by Salmon Nostra, Nostrat, and uh, also another New York Times bestseller, uh, The Gutsy Girl by Carolyn Paul. I still want to know what that means, New York Times bestseller, because it is an amazing um, connection. But, uh, you know, I, if you're on a New York Times bestseller list, um, it's good for your book. I know that much, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and Wendy is the uh, creator and host of Draw Together, a participatory drawing show for kids and the Grown Ups Table, providing lessons and community for drawing-minded adults. And that's different than the Kids Table, which is uh, where the kids draw, I guess. So um, like Dorothea Lang, Wendy's work is grounded in storytelling, as I said, and it's about looking and listening and creating images of often overlooked people, places, and things. Uh, so I also want to mention that tomorrow, Saturday, from 11 to 3 uh, in the uh, uh, East Building uh, Atrium, I believe, uh, Wendy will be uh, doing a, a drawing program uh, here at the National Gallery of Art, a participatory program. It's called Draw Together Strangers, uh, featuring Wendy McNaughton. And so I invite you all to come to that. And I'm sure that uh, she will have you drawing in ways you never knew you could draw. She's also threatened to have me drawing today, but I'm, I'm not sure what will happen with that. Um, and I, I want to just finish by mentioning also tomorrow in the East Building Auditorium, starting at 2 p.m., uh, we're showing two films uh, related to Dorothy Lang in this program. Um, uh, the first is going to be the world premiere of a, uh, national new national gallery video and it's called um photograph like a great dorothea lang uh, and it's starring uh dc based photographer d dwyer and it's an amazing uh video so please come to see it and uh as i told d uh when i first saw it she really kind of stole the show in the best possible way uh and then it's going to be followed by a feature link documentary about Dorothea Lang called uh, Grab a Hunk of Lightning, which is directed and produced by uh, Diana Taylor, who is Dorothea Lang's granddaughter. So, uh, all that said, I want to welcome uh, Wendy McNaughton to uh, talk to us about Dorothea Lang and drawing. Hi. How's everybody doing? Thanks for coming out. Um, thanks, Philip. 
Uh, this is a like this is this is a ridiculous honor for me, y'all. <laughs> this is incredible. Um, to be in the National Gallery, to be in the space with this incredible show. If you haven't had a chance to see it, please immediately. I mean, I would suggest you actually get up and just go look at it right now, <laughs> but or right after this, get over and see it. Um, it's a dream to see that, and um, it's a dream come true to be here in conversation with you all and talk about Dorothea, who is my hero, truly my hero. And I think for a lot of us who are visual storytellers, um, she is very much in our bones. She is in our DNA. She is literally in a framed photo in my bathroom, okay? <laughs> my grandmother is smaller, don't tell her. <laughs> um, but... It's it's just such an honor to be here. So thank you to everybody for the um, to the, the National Gallery for bringing me here to speak with all of you. Um, so I'm going to talk about my work, and I'm going to talk about Dorothea's work, and I'm going to talk about the intersection, the two, and how our trajectories they kind of coincide and they speak to each other. And if I may be so bold, the lessons that I've learned from Dorothea to push against the expectations and collaborative dynamics of portraiture and visual storytelling. So I'm interested in reconsidering portrait drawing as a processed focused social practice that can deepen our experience and understanding of ourselves and one another from the inside out. So those are like a lot of big words that basically mean I just um, I'm interest, interested in how drawing can help us see each other. That makes sense. Um, but first, before I talk about that, I just want to ask everybody two questions first. Um, how many people here have ever made a portrait of someone? Can you raise your hand? Oh, wow. I think we have a group of artists in the house. I love it. Okay. How many people have had portraits made of you? Okay. Also some, less. We might change that today and have everybody make one, but first... But first, I'll come back to that. So I think everybody here, although many people are drawers, I'm getting this chance, the idea that this is a creative room. Um, but back when we were young, everybody here drew, right? Pretty much everybody drew um, when we were kids. And there was a pretty good chance that at some point you were drawing a face, a person, and a grown-up came along and looked over and said, um, what's that? And you said, it's a face. And they said, that's not a face. This is what a face looks like. And they drew this thing. I mean, two dots, triangle, no, this, this is, and then we learned that that's what a face looks like. That's why so many of us draw like that now. But what that is, is that's an icon. It's a visual shorthand. And it's how we look and see a lot of the world. We have so much information coming in all the time that we reduce things to this visual shorthand. And as a result, we don't really look and see who and what is in front of us. And so today, I am going to teach you a little trick to start seeing one another again. Um, I think when you sat down, there was a little bag, and inside was a sketchbook and a pencil. Yes? If you wouldn't mind grabbing that and opening it up, I'm going to invite you, which is a passive-aggressive way of saying make you, um, do a little drawing with me. So as you're getting those out, <laughs> Dorothea said, the camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. I think that drawing does the same. So if you could um, get that ready and then turn to somebody next to you, ideally in the direction of the person you don't know, a stranger, I am going to ask you all to draw with me. You're going to draw each other. For 60 seconds. Oh, yes. Okay, find your partner. Okay, now look back at me. Okay, now you have to look back at me. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to draw each other with two rules, okay? It's only going to be 60 seconds. First, you know what? This drawing is not going to be a good drawing, so don't worry. It's, I promise it's going to be ridiculous. 
first rule, you are never going to lift your pencil, it's pencil, up off the paper. One continuous line, okay? The other rule is you are never, ever, ever allowed to look down at the paper upon which you are drawing, okay? Got that? I'm up here. If I see you look down, I may call you out, okay? So, so don't do it. 60 seconds, you can do it. So put your pencil down on the paper, look at your partner, Okay. And when I say go, begin drawing and go slow. Three, two, what? Ah, you know what? Let's take a deep breath. Deep breath in, let it out and start drawing. Now just go slow, move slow. Imagine that your pencil and your eye are connected. And as you're moving your eyes around your partner's face, you move your pencil right along with it. Try and pay attention to little details. Go slow, look closely. See if you can find a little detail that you did not notice when you first sat down. And include that in your drawing. Just slow down and look closely. Don't look down. I totally just saw you look down. Don't do that. Keep going. Keep drawing. Just look closely. Just another few seconds to finish it up. Don't look down. Three, two, one. Okay, you can look down at your drawing now. How are they? How are they? Yes! Oh, they're amazing. Oh, can you shut? Can you guys hold them up? Can we sh show your partner and hold them up? I got to see. Oh, yeah, that's incredible. Okay. All right. Okay, now, now you have to look at me. Now you have to. Yeah, now I'm talking again. Okay, <laughs> now you look at me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so how was that? Kind of amazing, right? It's, uh, it's such a cool way to make, first of all, a super fun, unexpected portrait of somebody. There's no way you could have expected to make that. And it's full of energy and life. It's very much in the present. And also, what you all did, in addition to making that portrait, was you just looked at another person for 60 seconds without looking away. That is something we do not do. And moreover, you just allowed yourself to be looked at for 60 seconds without looking away. Um, I believe that when we slow down and we look closely at each other like this, it opens up a line of connection that we just do not experience in the world anymore. And it starts a real relationship and conversation. So thank you for doing that with me. Um, you can trade your portraits, tear them out if you want later, or <laughs> gift them. Okay. All right. So back to the point of drawing, connecting, you all just basically learn to do that in 60 seconds, right? Um, and we're going to come back to that later. We'll get back to that. Um, but right now we're going to dive into a very serious, we're at the National Gallery, a very serious Dorothea Lang, Wendy McNaughton conversation. Um, so seeing people, the title of this exhibition is really close to my heart. What Dorothea did with the camera is very similar to what I try and do and what you all just did uh, with drawing, which is see people. So what does that mean, to see people? What happens when we look at someone and when we look past them? What happens when we really slow down and see someone? How does that change our relationship to them? What are the costs of overlooking people? And what does it feel like, well, when you, when I, when we get ignored, how does that impact our bodies? How does that impact our hearts and our minds? And then how does that play out politically and socially and economically? 
Those are some of the big questions that are baked into this genre called portraiture. So just to frame this conversation, I want to quickly look back to some old time painted portraits. They go back like 5,000 years ago, people started painting portraits, right? Here's one from the 1700s. Uh, it kind of nails what portraiture used to mean. Uh, before photography was invented, painting, drawing, and sculpture, that's the only way there was to record someone's appearance. It was expensive. It was difficult to make. So it was something that really only the wealthy and the powerful had access to. Mm. Until the mid-1800s, with a few rare exceptions, it was mostly people with power who were memorials, memorialized and, as a result, remembered. Portraits were for the few, and they were often for self-promotion. But photography's invention in the mid-1800s changed everything. The relative accessibility changed who got to be the subject of portraits and who got to make them. As cameras got smaller, became more mobile, then cheaper, then digital, portraiture became more and more democratic. Today, everyone has a camera in their pocket capable of taking an infinite number of photographs and instantly broadcasting them to any number of people everywhere in the world. What a portrait means has changed, like, you know, selfies. But the basics of portraiture have not changed so much. Generally speaking, there's a subject and there's an artist, and the question remains, who is and who is not seen? And how are they presented or how do they present themselves and who is doing the looking? For me and my work, the question of portraiture today and what I'm interested in and what I'm interested in Dorothea's work lie in the relationship between the artist and their subject. Issues around stuff like narrative construction, power dynamics, boundaries of roles and relationships and of responsibility that comes along with that. So... For those of you who don't know me or my background, I have always been a drawer and an artist. That's me. I grew up drawing and felt comfortable identifying as an artist at a very early age. I went to figure classes, like figure drawing classes really early on. So early, in fact, the first naked person I saw out of my immediate family was in a figure drawing class. Um, and I ended up going to art school for drawing and painting where I abruptly stopped drawing and started making some of the worst conceptual art that none of you will ever see. Uh, I was interested in how people think and how they learn and what information reaches people and what doesn't. And as a queer Jewish person, moreover, as someone who passes, I was interested in how we present ourselves, what we show, what we hide, and how we present our identities. So I got interested in advertising and the way that an ad presents these things and how it could capture the attention of millions of people while a painting in a gallery on a good day might get 30. So after graduating, I landed a job as a copywriter at a big advertising agency in San Francisco. My role was to come up with ad campaigns for companies like Budweiser and Hewlett Packard, a small little company you've probably heard of called eBay. Um, there were ping pong tables and we had like 25 cent beers in the vending machine. And it was supposed to be this like heaven for creative people, you know, um, but I was totally miserable, totally miserable. Um, so when through an unusual set of circumstances, I was offered the opportunity to create the national education campaign for Rwanda's first free and fair democratic election. And this was just six years after the genocide. And it was the first local election following it. I jumped at the chance. I had an unlikely set of skills that were needed for that job. Number one, um, I could come up with ideas for campaigns. Number two, I could draw. The campaign had to be accessible to everybody regardless of their level of literacy. Um, so it was all in pictures. And number three, I was in my 20s, which means that I was still young and dumb enough to think that I was remotely qualified for this responsibility. <laughs> Uh, and within days of working there, I realized I was in over my head. Uh, while I could come up with clever ideas to tell people what to do, my charge was to create a campaign to educate and motivate people in a positive way. This was supposed to inspire people to make their own decision 
And we were from different backgrounds, different cultures, entirely different life experiences, and entirely different visual languages. So all my intentions were never going to be helpful when also the problem was not actually mine to solve. I needed to learn how to work in a new way. I needed how to learn learn to work with people. So when I returned to the U.S., I went back to school to study social work. Um, Social work, you know, I wish that there was some kind of rule where we all took one semester or even one class um, of social work training. Uh, It's this incredibly valuable, um, underappreciated field. It teaches us uh, basic research skills like active listening, ethnographic research, interviewing techniques, um, and it helps people learn how to think in terms of ecosystems, how we as individuals Uh, live within multiple systems and how those shape ourselves and our lives and how we need to consider all of those systems when we're working with people. So I was applying these skills that I'd learned in advertising and social work to creating communication campaigns for nonprofits when another plot twist here. After 10 years of not drawing, I started drawing again. And when I did, I started drawing portraits I was on the subway commuting from Oakland to downtown San Francisco. Mm. Excuse me. And before, this was before there were smartphones. So everybody was, um, instead of looking at a screen, they were kind of spacing out, looking out the window, really lost in their thoughts. And in that liminal space between the personal, you know, home self and the work self. And they were holding perfectly still. And they reminded me so much of those figure drawing classes from way back when that I did. So I pulled out my sketchbook and I started drawing. And in addition to drawing the people that I saw around me, I started writing little stories, my own thoughts as captions to accompany those portraits. And I literally kind of projected my ideas onto um, these people. The portraits were kind of like artful comics. And after a couple of years, They caught the attention of an editor who offered me a drawn column in an online literary publication called The Rumpus. I jumped at it, but I told the editor if I was going to publish these things for real, I was going to kind of do it the social work way. I needed to make a change. I wanted to elevate the words of the people that I spoke with, the people that I was drawing, not my own, which made me reconsider who I was going to draw. So channeling that social work self I thought about um, people around me in San Francisco who I saw, but I often overlooked, who I was curious about. And I thought of um, this group of guys that was on Market Street in downtown San Francisco who played chess. I'd seen them my whole life, and I'd always wondered about them, but I never actually stopped. Um, So I settled on them. I named the column Meanwhile, as in um, all of these kind of Fast-paced, shiny things are happening, but in the meanwhile, in San Francisco, there's something else. And I went down to Market Street to draw. I was nervous, so scared. I took um, my sketchbook and I felt totally out of place, but I stood there probably about 10 feet away and I drew. And then I drew more and then I ran away. And then the next day I went back and I drew again. And by the end of the day, somebody asked me what the hell I was doing there. And that's how our first conversation began. At the time, I had no idea that in the very same city, nearly 100 years earlier, Dorothea Lang, my hero, had experienced a really similar professional trajectory and was doing something very similar on the streets. This photograph is called White Angel Breadline. Um, It's in the show, Seeing People, here at the National Gallery. Um, This photo was, in a sense, the original, meanwhile, in San Francisco. When Dorothea took this photo, she was one of San Francisco's most successful portrait photographers. She'd grown up in the New York area and got stuck in San Francisco when she was traveling with her best friend. She was just 23 years old. Um, By the way, Philip, if I get any of this wrong, please just holler at me, okay? Um, Thanks. They were both actually pickpocketed 
and lost their passport and money, and they had to get a job real fast. And um, Dorothea had long wanted to be a photographer. She trained as a photo assistant back in New York, um, and she had some skills, and she had charisma, and she was able to get a job really quickly as an assistant to one of San Francisco's leading portrait photographers. She paid close attention and sharpened her skills around photography and working with people and quickly rose in the field, becoming a notable portraitist herself. Just over a year later, she opened her own studio and immediately attracted some of the most elite subjects um, in the art culture and in San Francisco society. <clears throat> Dorothea also met and married the swashbuckling, handsome American outdoor painter Maynard Dixon, who was 21 years her senior. They had two children, and often leaving the children at home with boarders, she accompanied him as they traveled around the United States, photographing as they went, and she became more and more comfortable with shooting outside the studio in natural light on the fly. <clears throat> Uh, as a studio portrait photographer, Dorothea's job was much like that of the portrait painters I mentioned earlier. It was to make people look good and feel good, um, to promote them, in a sense. She worked hard. She was really good at it, earned her a lot of success. But she also had a keen eye for real life and people who were overlooked. Um, I want to rewind and give a little context uh, for Dorothea's life that I think is really important in getting a sense of why she did what she did. When she was seven, Dorothea um, contracted polio, um, and it left her with a weak foot and lower leg and caused her to walk with a limp. Her parents separated not long after, um, which was also a perceived handicap for kids at the time. Uh, divorce was a stigma. Um, but she was a strong-willed little girl, um, and she felt like an outsider. And I think that any of us who have ever felt like outsiders know the power, the superpowers of observation that comes along with that. Um, every day, she would take long walks through what was then a very, very poor Lower East Side to get to school. And that's where she learned to put on what she called her cloak of invisibility. She could see everyone around her, but they could not see her. And she probably got a layer of curiosity and compassion and comfort with people different from herself there too. So back to San Francisco now. Um, the depression hit 1929. And over the next few years, things got worse and worse. The suffering of the most vulnerable became more and more evident. And just right outside her own studio on Montgomery Street, um, she could see what was going on. She said, I was well aware that there was a very large world out there that I had not entered too well, and I decided I'd better. And she was afraid. She said she was nervous, but she loaded her film into her camera and headed out into the streets and documented what she saw. Soon after her first walk into the streets, a little while after, she quit working in the studio and dedicated herself to photographing people as she witnessed them in the streets, as she saw them. Between her life experience, her professional training in photography, and her travels with Maynard Dixon, she'd built up a unique practice of looking closely and seeing things, seeing people who get overlooked. And she took all of that experience with her to the streets. She trained her eye to focus on the meanwhile. Flash forward, I kept drawing in San Francisco. I kept doing stories. I did the chess players. I went on to do um, uh, farmers, the farmer's market, swimmers in the bay, and San Francisco Public Library, on and on. And I was developing my own kind of methodology including um, skills that helped open doors uh, to connecting with people and to talking with people. Um, and also I was gaining skills on how to position stories to make a social impact. Uh, I did a story about the people in the history of a small pocket of San Francisco um, in the South of Market, Fifth and Sixth Street, two blocks right next to each other, but they're really a world away. Uh, this was about 2010. 
in San Francisco and tech was booming, money was pouring into San Francisco. And at the same time, people who had lived there for generations were being pushed out. Uh, the corner of Fifth Street is the home of uh, like the company Square and the San Francisco Chronicle, Bloomingdale's parking garage. And the corner of Sixth had one of the highest crime rates in the city, um, a ton of drugs, people passed out on the street. It was really a, a tough block. People from Fifth stayed away from Sixth and people from Sixth stayed away from Fifth. And I wanted to learn how these two distinct San Francisco's came to be right next to each other. So I was afraid like I always am, um, but took my sketchbook to the corner of 6th and I stood there and then I left and then I stood there the next day and drew more and then I left. And on the third day, that's when I met Ray, we started talking. Ray then introduced me to Big Face and he became my guide. Um, so my methodology is this, it's very sophisticated. I call it hanging out. I hang out. I hang out. I talk to people. I draw things that catch my attention. I write everything down that everyone says to me as verbatim as I can. I do my best to get people's words. Um, then back at my studio, I paint the portraits um, and all the drawings that I do, and I couple the people's words uh, with the finished drawings and create uh, a narrative, a finished story, what I call a drawn documentary. I take a lot of liberty with editing and in doing that, try and get to mm, the real core truth of what I've heard and seen. Uh, an example of my sophisticated methodology is called eavesdropping. Um, <laughs> I stood on the corner of 5th Street and 6th Street uh, for five minutes and wrote down everything I heard people say. And then I drew one person at 5th and 6th. I drew literally like walking after them, you know, <laughs> drawing and walking and inter interesting. I challenge you all to do it with your new sketchbooks. It's fun. Um, but when you juxtapose these two things, you can get a really clear snapshot um, of two different things going on right next to each other. So I hung out there for about three weeks and drawing on my social work skills, I interviewed everybody, made notes um, and came to see Sixth Street much less as a crime-ridden neighborhood and more as one of the few remaining neighborhoods for poor folks to live in San Francisco and a tight interdependent community of people who didn't have structural support. The finished piece was published in the Rumpus and installed in the Chronicle building where it was seen by leaders of tech companies who then invited me to speak with their employees, which was really great. But more importantly, folks whose words were in the portraits um, and whose portraits were included in the show and in the story, they came to the exhibition and they spoke alongside the piece. It was a collaboration and drew a lot on my social work practice and ethos. And that became and continues to be the foundation of my work. Accountability to myself as an artist and to my collaborators. Dorothea said, I never steal a photograph, never. All photographs are made in combination, or sorry, in collaboration as part of their thinking as well as mine. <coughs> so Dorothea had uh, only been photographing people in San Francisco streets a short time when Paul Taylor, a professor of economics at UC Berkeley, spotted her photos. Paul was working on bringing attention to the plight of laborers through research and publishing and understanding um, that his words, quote, alone could not convey the conditions. Uh, he began using her photos to accompany his stories. After a successful photo research trip, he included Dorothea as a collaborator in a government-funded research and communication project, and then they began working together regularly. Paul taught Dorothea a more ethnographic approach to photography, incorporating research, interviewing, and copious note-taking and documentation. In a 1965 interview, Dorothea said, the words that come directly from people are the greatest. If you substitute one out of your own vocabulary, it disappears before your eyes. What the right words can do for some photographs is enormous. And Dorothea taught Paul how to see. 
Together, they created this new third thing, a kind of social documentary photography that changed the trajectory of photography and social justice work and portraiture. The impact of their work together was profound. It secured government funding for housing, support for farmers, and a ton of other social services. And as you can probably tell from that photo, um, along the way, they also fell madly in love. Uh, they left their respective spouses and got married. So I was aware of Dorothea's travels with Paul around the U.S. when I was approached to do that drawn column um, for the New York Times. Uh, Meanwhile in San Francisco had become a book, and I was the back page columnist for California Sunday Magazine, and the Times asked me if I wanted to bring Meanwhile over to the Sunday paper's business section, making it the first visual column of its kind in the paper. Um, I said yes. <laughs> uh, wanting to hit the road um, and go around the U.S. because it's going to be national, right? Um, I built myself a mobile studio in the back of a Honda Element where I could sleep and work and file from the road. Yeah, so knowing that Dorothea had done this long before me gave me a real boost of bravery to get out on the road and discover stories. I spent a year doing stories for the Times on subjects ranging from long-haul truck drivers to the growing importance of soil, to the racial dimensions of access to natural resources, to the strengths and challenges of video visitations in prisons. I'm proud of all of the stories that I did and how I did them, but like Dorothea, my methodology was not always perfect, and it still isn't. I'm going to give you an example of both of us. We'll start with Dorothea. Of all of the photos she took, this might be her most famous. It's one of the most famous photos ever taken, um, known as the migrant mother. Uh, in March of 1936, Dorothea was driving home on Highway 101. She was exhausted from working on the road for a month, and she was desperate to get back. It was freezing cold that year, so cold that the fields had frozen. Farmers who traveled there to work were stranded. No food, no work, no money, nowhere to go. Dorothea drove past a camp as she was going north on the 101, and she spotted a sign pointing to a pea picker's camp off the side. She was tired. She kept going. But 20 minutes later, she had this gut tugging, you know, tugging in her gut, telling her to go back. She turned the car around to visit the camp. It was freezing. She was tired. She was rushed. And instead, instead of spending the time getting to know people like she usually did, she hurriedly snapped some photos, wrote down what she remembered from her brief conversations with the farmers, and moved on. In 1936, Dorothea and Paul Taylor published this image with the caption, quote, a blighted pea crop in California in 1935 left the pickers without work. This family sold their tent to get food. Soon after the photos were printed, the government sent 20,000 pounds of food to the area. Pretty impressive response. Decades later, Dorothea was interviewed about the photo. She claimed to have been drawn to this migrant mother like a magnet. That's a quote. She said she didn't ask her about her name or her history. She said the woman was 32, that she and her children were living on frozen vegetables and birds the children had killed, and that she just sold the tires from her car to buy food. She said the woman was white. Then, in 1978, a woman named Florence Owens Thompson wrote the Modesto paper claiming she was the migrant mother. And Dorothea had gotten her facts wrong. They had not sold their tent or tires or anything else that that caption had claimed. And Florence was not white. She was of Cherokee descent. It was irksome to Florence that her and her children were misrepresented in so many ways. They were, in fact, very proud of their hard work and their resilience. And to add insult to injury, photos of their family had sold for enormous sums of money at this point. And at the end of her life, Florence was living alone in a trailer riddled with health problems. Her family did not see a penny from those sales. 
She also said Dorothea told her that she'd send her a print of the photo, and Dorothea never did. Okay, so I'll stop there. That's very, very complicated for me, y'all. That's, that's, that's a lot. Uh, whitewashing a Cherokee woman for a photo like this contributed to an ongoing disappearing of indigenous black and brown people in the USA. And also, Dorothea was told by her boss to train her lens primarily on white people because he said that white people would get a stronger response from a primarily white audience like policymakers. For the record, Dorothea did not listen to her boss, um, but the editors usually got the last say in which photos ended up being published and sometimes which captions went with them. Dorothea did do a very sloppy job with her notes and got facts wrong. And also, she was exhausted and she was cold. She was tired and she made mistakes. And at the same time, the publication of that photo immediately got the government to send all that food. So beyond getting permission and the facts right, does Dorothea have any obligations to Florence and her family? If she's really collaborating with her subjects, when does that stop? When did that start? And is that just at the convenience of an artist? I don't know. That takes me to Dawn. So I feel about as good as I can around my collaboration with Don, the bootmaker. But I'm haunted by those questions Dorothea's work brings up with him and with all the stories I do. I met Don in a very eerily similar, similar way to how Dorothea met Florence. I was driving through Southern Utah when I passed a hand-painted sign on the side of the road that said bootmaker. I kept driving but my gut tugged at me to turn around. I did, pulled off the road, parked, and knocked on the door of a small workshop. A mustached man opened the door and found me, wearing a jumpsuit, and invited me in. And here's where things diverge um, with Dorothea's experience. I spent the whole day with Don. I drew him working in his workshop, wrote down everything he said, even recorded some of it. I took photos for reference. I took down his phone number and his email to follow up. And by the time I left, we were so friendly that we hugged goodbye. And when Don's story was going to run in the New York Times, I called him. And, okay, the New York Times does not know this, so if we could keep it in the room, that'd be great. Okay? I called him, and I ran the entire story by him first. Um that could have gotten me canned. Here's, here's the deal with reporting. Journalists are not allowed to run quotes by their sources before they go in a newspaper. Fact checkers will call and they'll, they'll call and ask for general information. But sources, you don't, tell your, you don't tell the quotes beforehand. Um, here's the deal with me. I, I don't care. I don't care. Um, I ran every single quote that I ever published as best I could by every subject that I ever spoke with. Why? Because I am telling their story. And I know my memory can be faulty. And I am biased. And I have blind spots. And I want to be sure that our collaboration is truly a collaboration and that I am not being extractive or reductive or projecting my story onto them. So that's informed by my ethics and my social work practice and the lessons that I've learned from Dorothea. Before Don's story came out, I called him. Um, I was going to mention him in a TED talk uh, that was going to get eyeballs. I called him, ran it by him. I do my best. Um, but it leaves me feeling uncomfortable. I still don't know what are the limitations of the responsibility to the people that I work with. If I financially benefit from collaborative work, should the subject of my work get paid too? Um, it's, these are not black and white issues. Mixing social work and art is really messy. And mixing it with journalism is really even messier. When the New York Times hired me to travel to Guantanamo Bay in 2019 to document the culture of the courtroom through drawings, I had no idea what I was walking into. Photography is not allowed in the courtroom. Only four artists had been before me. I was the first one hired by the Times to go. I knew there would be things I could and could not draw, 
and everything that I drew would have to be officially approved by the military before it left the courtroom. What I didn't expect were the guardrails put up to prevent any kind of human interaction between me and the people that I was drawing or any humanity whatsoever. Okay, so first, the courtroom is nearly 60 feet long. That means it's six stories deep. That is a very impossible distance to draw at if you're trying to get the details of somebody's face. No binoculars are allowed. And as a member of a press, I was instructed not to speak or signal to any of the attendees at that trial, especially family members of people who were killed in 9-11 unless they spoke to me first. And moreover, I was told that when I was drawing people in the courtroom, I was not allowed to make eye contact with anyone. I was told that if I was drawing someone and we did happen to make eye contact, that I should, quote, look right through them as if they weren't even there. Um, given my practices, as I've shared it today, you can see how that kind of goes against everything I do as an artist and as a human being. And at the same time, I'm going to be honest with you, that objectification of people was a big relief. Some folks I was drawing had claimed responsibility for the killing of thousands of people. And I do not know where to hold that in my body. By the end of my week of work there, I had started smoking again. I did my job as a visual journalist the best I could, and in doing so, realized that journalism, the so-called detached objective gaze, is not what I do. It is a very necessary thing in the world, but it is not in me. Art and social work and journalism. Maybe Dorothea grappled with a lot of this messiness too. I've learned from her trials and errors and expect someday others will learn from mistakes that I make in public also. It's hard with the speed of everything right now, so many people and images and so many interactions. How can we slow down and see someone and allow ourselves to be seen, connect with somebody with accountability, responsibility, and mutuality? What does a real collaboration look like these days? Which brings me to today here at the National Gallery and this phenomenal show of Dorothea's work her portraits, and the portraits that you all made at the start of this talk. Um, that's a part of a larger project called Draw Together Strangers. It's a public art piece. Um, go back to that in a second. Draw Together Strangers grew out of the Draw Together program I started with my former partner, Caroline Paul, the first day of school closures during the pandemic. I combined my social work skills and drawing skills to host a show for kids, a drawing show for kids and families. And yeah, we learned about light and shadow and how to make a fun dinosaur with a neck that kind of swirls around and all of that great stuff. But what we were really doing was um, teaching kids how to use drawing to slow down, get into their bodies, feel and process their feelings, pay attention, look closely, and connect with each other. After seeing the impact of Draw Together on literally tens of thousands of kids around the world, I turned my attention to teaching grown-ups also the skills I developed, meaning offering the opportunity for people to learn to use drawing as a vehicle to connect. Draw Together evolved into a nonprofit that works in classrooms. Um, it now touches about 300,000 learners around the world. And the grown-ups table, I think we have a few grown-ups table folks in here today, we are now 50,000 members strong. And it led to this. Draw Together Strangers, a deceptively simple social practice art piece. I'm not sure you realized it when you were drawing each other earlier, but you were doing something radical in the trajectory of portraiture. You flattened the power dynamic today. You became both in collaboration with another person the subject, and the artist. You slowed down, you looked closely at another person, and you allowed yourself to be seen. It's a hard time in the world right now. People are becoming increasingly fractured and polarized. And overwhelmed, scared, and feeling powerless, we look away from each other on the streets and in our libraries and in our schools. We keep our heads down, focused on our screens, connecting only to people who remind us of ourselves. We don't look at each other anymore. We don't see people 
anymore. The thing is, once you've slowed down and looked closely at someone, maybe by drawing them, it's hard not to feel open to them. And when we allow ourselves to also be seen by them at the same time, it's nearly impossible not to feel connected. I believe this is something that everybody can benefit from. And in fact, everybody should do from childhood on. Like Dorothea learned to look with her camera. And like I learned to look with my pen. Today, so did you. Tomorrow at the National Gallery, uh, we're going to set up and invite hundreds of strangers to slow down, pick up a pen, and see one another. And later this year, when it gets a little bit warmer, I'll get back into that mobile studio and head back out onto the road to draw. But this time, I'll be inviting other people to look and draw along with me. Again, Dorothea said, the camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. We say something in Draw Together, very simple. Drawing is looking, and looking is loving. Whether you use a camera or a pen or ceramics or any creative medium that you use to slow down, pay attention, and really look and listen, what matters is that we open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, and we see each other. And now you have a fun way to do it in 60 seconds. The pencil fits in your pocket. You can take it with you and do it anywhere. Um, so thank you to everybody for trying this with me today. Thank you to Dorothea for paving the way for all of this. Um, and thank you to the National Gallery for opening up this conversation. And thank you for all for taking a leap to see each other. Thanks.